Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The San Antonio police still on the scene of a shooting on the city's east side that sent one man to a hospital. Officers responding to the 300 block of Cactus a little after 3.30 this afternoon on a shots fired call. We first told you about the shooting at 5 o'clock today. When they got to the scene, they found a man believed to be in his 20s with a gunshot wound to his leg. They say the victim was unresponsive and had lost a lot of blood. He was rushed to a hospital. Police detained several people in the home where they believe that shooting happened, but no one has been arrested. Homicide investigators still on the scene, talking to them, trying to sort all this out. We'll continue to follow it. Meanwhile, it has been nearly eight months since local leaders began imposing restrictions as the COVID-19 pandemic arrived here in San Antonio. But as the months drag on, it's become more obvious that even while the virus hangs around, people's anxiety may be waiting, though that's not always a good thing. Garrett Berger talked with local doctors about what they're seeing from COVID fatigue. An ongoing pandemic didn't stop demonstrators from gathering around the country this weekend, including here in South Texas, as election results rolled in. Nor did it stop the joyful celebrations of Notre Dame students who rushed the field after a football win. Dr. Erica Gonzalez, the head of Stamp Allergy, thinks part of it is just human nature. I think it's the natural instinct to be like, hey, let's, you know, kind of all get together. Um, and we forget. I mean, we forget that we're in a time where we need to be taking these precautions. Gonzalez thinks COVID fatigue definitely exists. Those kind of big gatherings could be an example. And the generally low infection rates here in Bear County we're seeing after this summer spike may play a role in the local mentality. I think that that also made people kind of uh, uh, get a false sense of security that, hey, you know what, maybe this thing is over. Over at Texas Med Clinic, the chief medical officer is also a believer in the COVID fatigue phenomenon. You know, I've had it up to here and uh, <laughs> I'm not doing it anymore. But he's not currently seeing its consequences through big events. Instead, it's things like family dinners and weddings that have been recently sending cases to his chain of clinics. You know, uh, one woman specifically said her husband didn't want to go, didn't want her to go, but she thought, oh, it can't be that big of a risk. So she went. And so she's now, you know, one of the five that's positive. Precautions are still necessary, he says. Things like washing your hands, staying socially distant, and wearing a mask. But all that may still not be enough if someone around you isn't being careful too. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Meanwhile, early findings that the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine is 90% effective in humans are similar to what Texas Biomed found here in San Antonio among primates. Its CEO says the prototype vaccine it gave macaque monkeys like these was 100% effective after they were infected with the coronavirus. The study here is still ongoing. Pfizer also has a lot more work to do before it can ask the FDA for emergency authorization to begin using the vaccine on a limited basis. Even then, building public trust will be a big priority. But look, we have a huge challenge, and that is, for me to say it's safe is different than people feeling comfortable taking a brand new vaccine. And right now, there appears to be a lot of vaccine hesitancy. If we don't use the vaccine, then what good is it? Dr. Schlesinger predicts if the Pfizer vaccine proves both safe and effective, its distribution on a small scale may get underway later next year. Word of the effectiveness of that Pfizer vaccine sending the stock market soaring. The Dow Jones ended the day up by more than 800 points. At midday, it even flirted with the 30,000 mark. The vaccine news provided a glimpse of hope for the future, sending airline, energy and bank stocks way up. Even before the Pfizer announcement, the markets were lifted. Analysts say the election provided a sense of clarity for nervous investors. Still, there could be volatility ahead because there are still some unknowns. Uh, things continue to spike. How is Joe Biden going to handle that? Uh, what is he going to do? The stimulus package, what's going to happen with that? That's going to affect the stock market. As for your 401k, financial advisors do not recommend trying to guess and time the market. Instead, they say diversify your portfolio, make periodic investments, and be patient. A final gift for election workers. That's what Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Kaladin called today's free COVID-19 testing event for her staff. The testing comes after long weeks of staff working directly with voters to help make sure their voices were heard during this election. While workers used protective equipment during the election, the testing is a way to help them give them peace of mind. 
It was a promise we made to them when we saw all the election officials putting themselves out there for the voters, for this fantastic election. And as we prepared and we gave them all the PPE and all the safeguards, we said, this is the final thing we can do for you. Kalanen says the process of testing today went smoothly, thanks to election workers having to pre-register for the event. As of this morning, more than 890 workers had signed up. New at six, during the pandemic, acts of bigotry and violence have erupted towards certain cultural communities propelled by hate groups and conspiracy theories. Two communities being targeted, Asian Americans and Jews. Courtney Friedman was invited to moderate a discussion led by the Israeli consulate about San Antonio's anti-hate resolution and how it will help our region. That discussion will be released Thursday in its entirety on KSAT.com. In the meantime, here's Courtney with a preview. The pandemic hit, then blame was hatefully placed. One of the nurses went to a bakery and this person refused to serve her because she's Asian and she has the Chinese virus. Also targeted the Jewish community. Seems odd, but Consul General of Israel to the Southwest, Gilad Katz, says Jews commonly become scapegoats no matter what the event. The Holocaust wars, uh, and we understood, we know that we have to stand up for what we believe in, we have to share our values with other communities. And the Jewish community is doing that now with local Asian Americans being attacked and blamed for the pandemic, which originated in Wuhan, China. Unfortunately, many Asian Americans are reluctant to speak up since it's not in our culture to bring attention to ourselves. We felt that um, if people knew that their leaders uh, in their own jurisdictions uh, were standing up front and calling out these acts of hate and expressing support that, that people would feel more comfortable. So the Anti-Defamation League asked cities nationwide to adopt anti-hate resolutions. San Antonio did so this summer. Hatred and intolerance is a rot uh, and it must be cut out quickly or else it will grow. The consulate will be releasing this insightful hour-long discussion on Thursday, then we'll be putting it on KSAT.com and the KSAT TV app. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at time saver traffic right here. The camera at I-10 and Crossroads, you can see this is headed towards downtown. The 410 I-10 interchange there uh, looks like there's some red lights there, little stalled traffic. Uh, not sure exactly what's causing a tie up. You can see the one uh, car there off on the shoulder as the cars get onto that 410 ramp with the flashing lights. That may be what's leading to a bit of a slowdown here at I-10 and Crossroads. COVID-19 is taking a toll on Americans' mental health, but it may be affecting men and women differently. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 53% of women say they're feeling the stress from COVID compared to 37% of men. As Ursula Perry reports, new research indicates a serious work-life unbalance for some women during the pandemic. Meals, laundry, child care. In most U.S. homes, household work was primarily mom's domain before the pandemic. But now... So we had this sort of unique opportunity to really understand, okay, what happens when you're forced to be at home? Do men do more? Are couples sharing the work more? Or is it status quo? Pets and his research team surveyed 1,060 U.S. parents living with a partner of the opposite sex. They analyzed changes in the division of labor for household chores and child care since the pandemic began. For a subset of, of women, about a third of women, things have gotten significantly worse. According to the survey, 34% of moms say they're spending more time house cleaning. 43% say they're doing more cooking. And don't forget about kids' online learning. Women are taking on the majority of, of those tasks as well. But the news isn't all bad. In a number of families, fathers have increased homework time, and 45% of dads reported spending more time taking care of young children. There is a possibility in this study showing that once those restrictions are lifted, then there will be a restructuring in the division of labor between men and women. Then again, there's always the possibility that things just could go back to the way they were. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Taking a live look outside with live cam on this Monday. 
saw a little bit of sprinkles on my windshield as I came into work earlier this morning. Lots of clouds out there all day. Not a real nice looking day. Huh? Yeah, we had the added humidity in the air and this time of year it's easier to generate those low clouds than even some fog and sprinkles and I think we'll have the same story again tomorrow morning trace of rain. That's all it was. It doesn't add up to to much today. We started at 67, which is well above the average morning low of 53. It's the extra humidity in the air that gives us those warmer mornings. 84 degrees. That was our high today, and that was nine degrees above average right now. 81 Holotus Randolph area at 76, 75 in New Braunfels. Bernie Stage Airfield reporting 73 and Hondo still at 78 near 70 in Rock Springs, but hanging on to the low 80s southwest of San Antonio this evening. Not not a huge temperature drop. If you have outdoor plans, don't anticipate that real noticeable chill a few hours after sunset. I mean, 8 p.m. 73, 10 p.m. right near 70. So mild and actually a bit humid out there with those low clouds redeveloping later tonight and especially by early tomorrow morning. We'll start the day with the low clouds. Can't rule out some fog, maybe a sprinkle or two, and then we'll have sunshine and make it up to 80 for the high temperature. So 65 in the morning to 80 later in the day. It's hard to believe that a weak cold front is actually moving through tomorrow, but you will notice some changes as we get into Veterans Day. We'll talk more about that and our next cold front over the weekend coming up. Just about time now for the daily briefing on COVID-19 cases here locally. Every Monday we hear about the risk level for our area. Let's see if that has changed since last week. Let's go live to City Hall. Tonight we're reporting a significant jump in new cases. It's 417, which brings our cumulative total to 68,044. The new seven day moving average is up to 234. Fortunately, we do have no new deaths to report tonight, but we know that uh, this pandemic has been very deadly and taken a number of our friends and family and loved ones from us. And so please keep their friends and families in your prayers this evening. The hospital system is treating 200 94 COVID patients tonight, including 39 new COVID-19 related missions since the last 24 hours. We have 118 patients in the ICU and 56 patients on ventilators. It's Monday and the progress and warning indicators look the same uh, roughly as last week. The overall risk level remains moderate and the 14 day trends shows that we're still in a period of rebounding of infections, which is not good. And the positivity rate has jumped a bit again, uh, not quite as much as the last few weeks, but it is up seven tenths of a percentage point to 8.4%. We have a new EPI report to, to show you as well, and you can find this online. Uh, we report these uh, deep dives into the data monthly, and it'll be reported, uh, posted for public viewing a little bit later this week. So here are some of the initial key takeaways. Compared to September, COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations were up in October, as were the total number of cases at the no-cost testing sites. Males are less likely to get tested for COVID-19 in our community, but more likely to die from it. For you men out there, let me say it again. Males are less likely to get tested for COVID-19, but are more likely to die from it. We're not invincible. Take these warnings seriously. Also, we're seeing young adults in their 20s and 30s getting COVID-19 at higher rates than the general public population. If you remember, the case rate among this same age group spiked in June right before the July surge, which could mean that the increased rate of infection among young adults may be an early warning indicator of a surge in cases. Older individuals account for the lowest proportion of cases, but carry the highest burden of COVID-19 disease severity, leading to death. And Hispanic Latino cases continue to carry a disproportionate burden of hospitalization and death from COVID-19 in the San Antonio area. So those are some of the initial key takeaways. Again, the entire EPI report, which is a deep dive into our COVID-19 data, will be uh, posted on the website a little bit later this week. Let me turn it over now to Bear County Judge Nelson Ward. Well, thanks, Mayor. I'm glad to be back. Uh, by the way, that was a self-imposed thing. I didn't have to do that. I did stay home for five days. I did have two tests. Both are negative. Uh, just out of a sense of caution, I did that. I uh, only had three people in my office. One of them did have it. He was asymptomatic. He's still not sick. The other two took tests. They're fine. Everybody on our floor took tests. They're okay. So I'm back at this thing. Um, let me say just a couple of things about schools that really, really are troublesome. Um, I talked to Brian Woods today, who's a superintendent at um, 
Northside Independent School District. And we've seen in, in our uh, EPI report, you know, a bounce up because more and more kids are returning to school. But here's, here's what you're faced with. If a kid is at home and we're losing a lot of them, uh, they're not tuning in to the uh, uh, distant learning. They're, they, we don't know where they are. We don't know what they're doing. Uh, and so the TEA put out a, a deal saying they could force those students back to school. So what does that mean? That means we will have more in school. Uh, we do know that there will be the danger of COVID happening. But the offsetting thing is these kids are not getting the food programs that they should be entitled to. They don't have access to nursing. They don't have access to counseling. And they're certainly not tuning in uh, with distant learning. So we're going to be losing a lot of kids. And I know it's very, very difficult for the teachers and the superintendents and and parents, but um, if they'll continue to be as safe as they can be, and uh, uh, it's really important that we don't lose a generation of young people um, uh, because they've missed all the critical aspects of education. Um, let me say a couple things about the hospital. That, again, is the one I always watch the most, and it was troublesome to see those numbers go up, but 55 of those patients, COVID patients, are from El Paso. We've never had to deal with that again, uh, before, and so that's driving our numbers up, and I think what we were over 7%, 7 something uh, in terms of, uh, of the rate in the hospital. So we are concerned about that. Uh, I think we're really around, instead of 295, we're around 240, which is still a little bit higher. Uh, so we gotta watch those numbers closely. Uh, the youth, we've gotta really emphasize to you guys, be careful. I know you think you're invincible, uh, because you're young and you're strong, and you may be, but uh, if you pick it up and take it over to someone else, uh, and um, you see, well, that's exactly what happened in our case. Um, staff member was young, brought it back, and you know, all of us had to uh, slow down and take tests and stay away for a while. Uh, so we really do need to uh, pay much attention to the safeguards. We are. Uh, testing a lot more people, thousands of more people in October than we did in September, and that's good because people need to find out if they have an issue or not. So we're just going to be careful. You know, we know that we'll probably continue to get some rise in it, just hopefully not a lot. And we know that winter's coming. We know that flu's here. We know that people are getting back in school. Uh, we know that Thanksgiving's coming. We know we just went through Halloween, and we know Christmas is coming. All danger signs. Yeah. Glad you're back, Judge. And, and again, for those who need assistance out there, do not hesitate to ask for it. And we want to draw your attention to the assistance programs that are available through the county and the city. In particular, if you're having trouble paying the rent or mortgage as a result of COVID-19 and job loss, we do have an emergency housing assistance program. Some pretty eye-catching numbers in the daily update today for COVID-19 cases. 417 new cases reported by the mayor there this evening. No new deaths. That is good news. The number of hospitalizations for the first time were pretty close to 300. 294 people currently hospitalized with COVID-19. But you heard... Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf, who's back after two negative COVID tests of his own, say that 55 of those patients are from El Paso, which we have talked about an area really seeing a surge in a lot of their patients, some of them anyway, having to be sent to uh, cities around the, the state, including San Antonio, to get treatment. And those trends that we've been watching, we get those on Monday, not going in the right direction. 234, now they average seven day total, uh, and the risk now at moderate still, 14-day uh, average continues to go up, and the positivity rate is at 8.4%. Uh, what caught my eye was that he said, you know, it's the folks in their 20s and 30s who are uh, really seeing an increase in cases, and that's similar to what we saw in the summer before we had that big spike. But while they're less likely to have, uh, you know, a bad outcome from that, it's the folks on the other end of that who are still... Uh, while there's fewer cases, they're the ones that are more likely to die from this. So. Absolutely. A lot of numbers to keep tabs on uh, as we are seeing a bit of an uptick here locally. Let's start at the weather now. Adam Kasky standing by in the Weather Center. 80 degrees out there. I'm, I'm still not used to taking that live cam shot and seeing yeah, it dark outside. Right? I'm just not there yet. I know. It's that time of year where after that time change, it's hard to mentally transition to that. And that also means that earlier in the evening, you start to see those temperatures fall off more because that sun is setting earlier. So the sun is 
down an hour longer than it was previously by 9 p.m. So you're noticing that temperature drop. Either way, take a look at temperatures right now across the state. No big changes. You have to head farther north and elsewhere across the nation in order to really see a change in those temperatures. And look at this. You get up into the northern plains, the prairie lands of North Dakota, South Dakota, 20s and 30s. So clearly a cold front dividing the nation right now. And that's where we have the cooler air. Denver, North Platte, Bismarck, all those locations, Dakotas, Nebraska, even creeping into Kansas. This is a real deal cold front. I just think the real deal cold air is going to stay far away from us and we'll just get clipped by this southern little extent of that cold front, which is mainly just a wind shift and a change in our humidity. So let's talk about the humidity dew points behind this boundary. Well, much drier, lower. The dew points are down in the 30s behind that boundary, and I think our dew points could get that low by about tomorrow night. So that Boundary is going to continue to push in eastward. You'll notice some humidity in the air tomorrow, especially the first part of the day, 65 degrees and cloudy, then 80 into the afternoon and we'll see some sunshine. The front will be a little more noticeable by Wednesday morning. At that point, 53 degrees, low humidity. Veterans Day, beautiful, sunny near 80 with low humidity. Then another week cold front on Saturday will again mainly just affect nighttime and morning temperatures. All right. Thanks, Adam. We'll be back right after this. The Judson High School football program has been shut down immediately, will not reopen until November the 17th as concerns over COVID-19 and the resulting contact tracing have put everything on hold in converse. That means Friday's big game and our big game coverage between the number one ranked Rockets and the third ranked Smith and Valley Rangers has been postponed. All of the drama unfolded right before our eyes during practice today as we were on campus for another story. Head coach Rodney Williams emerged from a meeting with athletic director Mike Miller to break the news to his team and then Miller broke it to us. The game has tentatively been rescheduled for uh, December 4th at 7.30 right here. So everything will be the same, it's just that we're moving the dates back. Our district, in its wisdom, when in our district meetings, made an allowance for this kind of a, of a circumstance, and uh, this is the first game this year that, that the Judson Rockets have had to uh, kind of reschedule. Now, our new big game this week will feature the Johnson Jaguars trying to stay undefeated against Madison Friday night at Hero Stadium. Just when the Fighting Texas Aggies are playing their best football in the Jimbo Fisher era, now this. All football operations have been shut down after the Aggies have learned of at least two positive coronavirus tests after returning from their best performance of the season. The 48-3 road route of South Carolina. Not only did San Antonio's own Kellen Mond throw four touchdown passes, but he ran for another. In doing so, Kellen broke the another school record for the most touchdown passes in his career. The Aggies now improved to 5-1. and one. They're ranked number five in the nation. And with the schedule they have left, they can easily win out their final four and finish 91. Now Saturday's game in Tennessee is in jeopardy. We have uh, paused our practice activities for the day where we will not practice. We will meet on Zoom with our players uh, to uh, uh, watch the film and uh, do the things we have to do. We had uh, a couple positive cases of COVID after we got back and retesting and we suspended things for the protocols or safety protocols to make sure we do our quarantine uh, tracing and all the things that go by and we're retesting the whole team again today and of course stay in the protocols that go all during the week so uh, we're in those processes now so we don't if there is more there there is a spread we're trying to prevent that and do everything from a safety issue with our players and our staff to uh, keep them as safe as possible if the game is played kickoff against the Vols in Tennessee on Saturday is set for 2 30. After eight straight games, the coronavirus finally caught up with the UTSA Roadrunners, forcing them to postpone their game against Rice this past Saturday. In his first comment since Roadrunners had to make that difficult call to postpone the game, head coach Jeff Trader says they found out on Thursday night, made the call on Friday morning. Now the big question is, will the Roadrunners be able to play their game against UTEP this Saturday in the Alamo Dome at 2 p.m.? Hopeful would be a good word. Obviously, we're tested again today and tested again Friday. Um, still waiting for results and just like I've told y'all many times before I don't ever feel good till my headset is thrown and I see the ball kicked off the tee and I know we're getting to play it's just there's so many things that are uncontrollable I think we need to be very careful 
Now, Trailer would not get into specific on how many players were affected by the positive test or the contact tracing, but did say it started with two positive tests in the athletic department. And I was just talking about this with our producer, Andrew Seeley, and this is the first sports COVID broadcast, all COVID related, we've had since May. Yeah. Wow. Very busy Monday. It means it's coming back. Yeah. Be very careful. Thank you, Greg. Mm. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. Election day has come and gone and the days following a winner has now been declared, but still a lot of questions for some people about what comes next. So let's get some perspective on that. Let's bring in Dr. John Taylor, UTSA political sciences professor. Thanks for being with us uh, here this evening. Let's first start talking about the lawsuits filed by the Trump campaign. <laughs> there How are a lot should, of them. <laughs> there are. I mean, you really have to kind of keep head on a swivel at this point to keep up with what's yeah. going on. So how should people be reading that information and trying to get a better understanding of where we go from here? Well, first of all, we do see lawsuits almost in every election cycle these days. We saw it in 2000, obviously, between Bush and Gore. We saw some in 2004 between Bush and Kerry. There were even lawsuits in 2012 and 2016. This is I don't like to say normal, but this is typical of what happens, the end game of a campaign, and particularly in a highly contentious election. How does this impact the transition stage here as this continues to, to play out? Obviously, we saw it in 2000. It went till December before it was really decided. How does that impact the transition that needs to happen? Well, this is a real difficult task because right now the, the head of the, of the General Services Administration is refusing to release the monies for the Biden transition team. Um, under the Presidential Transition Act of 1963, the president-elect and vice president-elect are supposed to be getting monies, resources, and personnel to begin that 70-plus day transition. It's not something that's very easy or simple. And given where we are now with COVID-19, with an economy, with a dangerous world, it's important to get that transition going. And we've talked about 2000, Bush versus Gore. There's been a lot of comparison to where we are now to that election. Is this different? If so, what makes it so different? It's definitely different because, well, first of all, it's Donald Trump. I don't mean to be facetious there, but it's definitely different in that regard. Um, it's different because the contentious, contentiousness is over, quote, a stolen election, over voter fraud, especially in four or five states, which is different than what we saw in Florida in 2000. If there's an analogy, a historical analogy, it's more, more akin to what happened in the election of 1876 between Samuel Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes, where three states it was so contentious with three states in the Electoral College, Congress had to have an electoral commission to, to finally figure it all out. The president has said so far that he has no plans to uh, go to the inauguration of Joe Biden, if that in fact is what happens. Have we seen that happen before? Yes, we have. Actually, five times in our history. John Adams refused to go to, to Thomas Jefferson's inauguration. John Quincy Adams refused to go to Andrew Jackson's inauguration. Probably the one that was probably the most contentious, Andrew Johnson, who was not running for, for re-election, obviously, but he refused. In fact, it was so nasty between Andrew Jackson and Ulysses Grant. Um, which Wilson didn't attend the inauguration per se. He actually attended uh, Herbert Hoover, excuse me, uh, uh, Warren G. Harding's at, uh, uh, at least escorted him to the U.S. Capitol, but didn't attend the inauguration because it was too cold for him. <laughs> you have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to American politics, and I think that we can learn a lot about the history of where we have come and what got us to today. And we're certainly watching history be sure. written as we speak right now. Oh, yeah. Is there anything that we can glean from what's happened in the past to give us a perspective about what we're watching play out right now? Well, uh, people people need to calm down. That would be helpful if they could do that. This is politics. This is the way the electoral process works. It may be messy. People may not like how it, it seems to take so much time. Um, that's the way the mechanism is set up. This is why the Constitution sets the election in early November, why the electors meet in December, because you have that roughly two to, to three to four week period to count the, 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 the actual votes to make sure things are certified. Then on December 14th, the electors actually meet to actually officially place Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris as president and vice president elect of the United States. Then Congress meets in January to actually read out the ballots and, and deal with any challenges that might come from the states. And then on January 20th, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are inaugurated. I'm curious, as a professor, obviously you have a lot of young minds looking up to you and for <laughs> guidance here. We're looking Maybe. to guidance for you. What are, their, what are their questions and what are your answers for them about how to read all of this, how to you know, just look at this and, and see history as it unfolds? 
Well, they're asking questions about why is this happening? Why does this seem to be so crazy? Um, why is this so contentious? And I've reminded them, I said, okay, I'm old enough to remember as a kid the 1960s, particularly 1968, and that contentiousness. Uh, to remember 1976 and the fact that election went on until 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning before Jimmy Carter was elected. Um, you know, the, between Bill Clinton and George Herbert Walker Bush and Ross Perot in 92, this is the, 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 the great tapestry that it is American politics politics and, and the electoral process. Um, it's, uh, I, I made a joke the other day that the presidential elections are political science's high holy day. And <laughs> in some respects it is because it's, it's fun, it's crazy, it's exciting. And I've gotten emails from, from faculty and from, from media around the world asking about, you know, what's going on and, you know, how, how do we explain these things? Well, you know, we don't explain it all. Um, that's part of politics and the fact that two years from now, things could radically change again. Four years from now, you could see a Republican win again. That's, the, again, the great thing about American politics. A lot of books to be written for sure. Yeah, I feel <laughs> oh, like yeah. we are all political science students in some degree uh, <laughs> right ahead. now in this day and age. <laughs> Dr. John Taylor, UTSA political science professor, as always, thanks for your insight and your time. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. All right. We'll be right back. McDonald's is shaking things up, trying to boost sagging sales. The burger chain is introducing new packaging, a new loyalty program, and working to improve drive through and delivery services. McDonald's will try out new concepts like automated order taking and express pickup lanes for people who place digital orders. Also, be on the lookout for things like toasty buns and an enhanced grilling approach for hamburgers. Following up on the success of the spicy chicken McNuggets, McDonald's will be launching a new crispy chicken sandwich early next year. And the McRib's coming back at some point, <laughs> too, if that's your thing. Let's take a look outside with live cam. 80 degrees right now. It's just been a humid day out there, Adam. Yeah, you notice a little increase in the humidity. Dew points back around 60 degrees. That's going to be the case for most of tomorrow, but a cold front will mix things up a little bit as we get into Wednesday on Veterans Day. We started the day at 67, made it up to 84, both well above average. Rock Springs topped out at 73, Kerrville 79. You see where the clouds lingered a bit longer, especially in the hill country, but Pleasanton, Catula, Gonzales, New Braunfels, 87 for their high temperatures. High temperatures, there will be some modifications, but especially in the low temperatures from a couple of cold fronts headed our way. We'll talk about that coming up. Definitely not the prettiest of days out there. No, and not feeling like I think it should for this yeah. time of year. <laughs> yeah, we are running above average. And yeah. we had such a long stretch of cooler conditions behind a stronger real deal cold front well, about two weeks ago now. But now we've moderated and we're back above average. And a lot of this actually follows the trend of a La Nina pattern. We do have La Nina going on right now. And typically, as we get into the late fall and winter, that would favor above average temperatures and drier than normal conditions. And unfortunately, rain chances are still looking pretty slim. Here are the morning low temperatures in the days ahead. We do have a few cold fronts that will be affecting us, but they'll mostly be impacting the morning lows and the humidity level. And you can tell when those fronts hit. We get into Wednesday morning, a little bit cooler. Sunday and Monday mornings back down into the lower 50s. So some changes coming along the way, but mainly just in the morning. So let's take a look at temperatures. Let's talk about this. And around our area, no big temperature difference out there. 84 Laredo, 83 Del Rio. 72 though in Kerrville, lower 70s in the hill country, but you widen out the view and that's where you see the real deal cold front. Behind that front in the core of the cold air, we've got temperatures in the 20s and 30s right now. So yeah, big difference behind the front, 20s and 30s, we're talking some sub freezing temperatures ahead of the front, 60s and 70s. So this is a really a hard hitting front, but unfortunately we're just going to get clipped by the very tail end of it, which is more of a wind shift and a way to dry our air out a bit. All the precipitation as well is staying out of our area. Unfortunately, it's along that boundary to the north and even over parts of the Colorado Rockies around here. This cold front will be mostly noticeable in terms of what we talked about the morning temperatures and also humidity or lack thereof for a brief period. Notice that boundary in West Texas right now. Behind it, on the west side of it, dew points down in the 
30s, 40s, and 50s. Out ahead of it, we've got those dew points in some cases into the 60s. So we feel the humidity right now, but this is going to move through and gradually drop off our humidity by about this time tomorrow. So tomorrow to start the day will still be pretty muggy, but then to by, by tomorrow evening and tomorrow night, dew points drop and it's going to be comfortable. Dew points in the 50s and that's why temperatures will be back down in the 50s by Wednesday morning. Though that humidity surges back into place by Thursday and Friday, only to be met by another cold front. And that cold front's going to hit this weekend and then drop those morning temperatures and that humidity again in the extended forecast. And in terms of moisture, you know, we do look at the tropics and we've been talking about Ada for a while now. This was a category four storm about a week ago, making landfall on the northeastern coast of Nicaragua. Now it's a tropical storm, max winds at 50 miles per hour. It did make landfall over the For Florida Keys, and that made it the 12th landfalling named storm this hurricane season in the Atlantic Basin for the United States, and that is a record for named storms making landfall. The worst was Laura category four, which of course remember wouldn't that hit Louisiana. Either way, this is going to stay off to the east of us. Eastern Gulf of Mexico. It dumped double digit rainfall in parts of South Florida, and now it's meandered well, basically just off the northwest coast of Cuba, and it's not going to do all that much more in terms of impacting our overall weather pattern for us around here. It's just not going to be a player. They'll see some effects in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. So this evening, that hint of humidity in the air, it's back. It's not overly muggy and uncomfortable, but compared to how dry the air has been, you notice this and mild too by 10 p.m. right near 70. Then low clouds developing again by early tomorrow morning. Maybe some patchy fog, a sprinkle or two, a little bit of drizzle can't be ruled out. Then we'll still make it to 80 degrees with sunshine by the afternoon. So kind of hard to believe a weak cold front's moving through. It's a weak one, but we're going to get it with that north wind at 10 to 15 and then a big drop in the humidity around and after sunset tomorrow evening. Low humidity on Veterans Day, 53 in the morning, but still sunny and 80 by the afternoon. Notice those high temperatures staying right near 80 degrees. It's the mornings that are going to be a little erratic and harder to plan ahead for. So just keep checking in and Remember, Wednesday morning and then Sunday and Monday mornings will be the coolest. All right. Thanks, Adam. We'll be right back. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning, everybody. We'll help you out an awesome weekend. 24-year-old Justine Garcia is facing charges. She reportedly darted across lanes of I-10, then hit a concrete median. Investigators say her three-month-old son was in a car seat, but it was not properly attached to the back seat. He ended up fracturing his skull. From the opening bell, stocks rocketed on news that Pfizer's vaccine looks to be highly effective. We can see that with this new Pfizer drug, that we can get out of this. Uh, things continue to spike. How is Joe Biden going to handle that? Uh, what is he going to do? The stimulus package, what's going to happen with that? That's going to affect the stock market. The pandemic hit, then blame was hatefully placed. One of the nurses went to a bakery and this person refused to serve her because she's Asian and she has the Chinese virus. Anti-Defamation League asked cities nationwide to adopt anti-hate resolutions. San Antonio did so this summer. Hatred and intolerance is a rot and it must be cut out quickly. We first told you about the shooting at 5 o'clock today. When they got to the scene, they found a man believed to be in his 20s with a gunshot wound to his leg. They say the victim was unresponsive and had lost a lot of blood. He was rushed to a hospital. Police detained several people in the home where they believe that shooting happened, but no one has been arrested. Homicide investigators still on the scene, talking to them, trying to sort all this out. Let's take a quick look at news around America on this Monday. News of a possible vaccine turning out to be the shot in the arm AMC theater stock needed. Shares for AMC shot up 80% this morning after the announcement from Pfizer. Cinemark saw a 40% increase. The vaccine news offered hope for the theater industry since shutting their doors back in March. Chains like AMC and Cinemark have definitely struggled. They tried to reopen with safety measures to help curb the virus's spread, but audiences so far have been reluctant to come back. 
The pharmacy chain Rite Aid opening what it calls the store of the future. No robots or high-tech stuff here, but the company officials are betting the new store design with the pharmacy up front is going to be a big hit with shoppers. There's also a wellness room where customers can schedule a visit with a licensed clinician. This is the third store of its kind for the chain, and there are plans to open two more next year. It comes at a time when drugstores are seeing some hefty competition from online retailers as people are making fewer trips to drugstores. I wish I had better news in terms of rain chances. Uh, odds are pretty slim here. We could have a stray sprinkle or two as we get into tomorrow morning and maybe a passing sprinkle around midday with that front. Otherwise, Saturday, a 20% chance. Unfortunately, that's really our best shot anytime soon. Tomorrow, we'll start the day at 65 degrees, but still make it to about 80. We'll go from the low morning clouds passing sprinkle to a lot of sunshine into the afternoon. Also, you will notice a drop in the humidity after sunset tomorrow, and that's going to set the stage for a very pleasant Veterans Day. Sunny, 53 in the morning, low humidity and 80 by the afternoon. Highs don't change much the rest of this week. What does go up and down is the morning lows. They're going to be anywhere from the low 50s to the mid 60s. All right, thanks, Adam, and thanks for watching the news at 6. We'll see you back here for the news at 10. Have a good evening.